So I think just to begin this discussion and sort of set the terms, uh, I'm going to ask you both, what is a DAO? Eric, why don't you start? Sure. So uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so, you know, it's in the name. It's a decentralized autonomous organization. Everybody has their own definition of the definition of each of those words, right? Um, but at its core, it's really a, a permissionless tool to coordinate or to allocate. Um, and to me, part of the definition is the uncensorability, the permissionlessness of using it, to, of interacting, of uh, achieving the mission that it sets out to, to do. Yeah, I feel like... Can you hear me? Oh. There you go. Okay. Um, yeah, it's working. I think for me, it's... Yeah, that's weird. Maybe hello, this. hello. Okay, we can do this. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I think for me, it's part of we took one of the original companies that we've been working for for years, and we kind of stripped it down, got rid of all the procedures, and we're trying to figure out what is actually needed and what we just like added over the years and we don't need anymore. So it's kind of a way to reinvent and explore and iterate faster on this whole organizational model and figure out with all the new tools that we have now in the online age, with all the communities and all the ways that we have to interact with each other and work together, what are the things that are actually core to the idea of an organization or of a DAO, and what are the things that we can just like get rid of? So just to like press on this a little, um, what separates a DAO from like a group chat with a bank account? <laughs> yeah, so I think there are a lot of a lot of those out there that, that do call themselves DAOs. And there is a spectrum of, of each uh, component of a DAO. Uh, but again, to me, if you can't affect the core purpose that a DAO is organized for uh, permissionlessly, and regardless of what happens in you know, human meat space, uh, then I, I'm, I'm not sure it would really reflect what a DAO's purpose is. You know, um, a, a group chat with a bank account is known as a general partnership. So, uh, you know, many DAOs might be classified as that, absent some other legal entity too. But um, the, the difference is in, uh, again, regardless of what happens legally or in the real world, the, the, the contract persists and uh, the ability to act as a DAO persists as well. I think legal definitions aside, for me, the difference is where um, the organization has a clarified mission or if it's just like, oh, we have a bunch of money, let's do something with it. If it's uh, like we're trying to buy something or we're trying to build something, it, then it's a DAO. And if it's just, yeah, we, ca we have a bunch of money, we raise a bunch of money, or we are trying to figure out what to do, then it's just a group set. So in terms of governance models, what does that mean? Like, how do you think about governing a DAO? How do you make it leaderless? How do you make it decentralized so that it sort of meets the definition you're talking about? Uh, governance is another complicated term that humans have literally never figured out in history. So um, we should probably start with some humility that we're not going to figure it out now. Uh, but the nice thing about DAO governance is it's, it's very programmatic and it's very transparent. So you, you know what you're getting. You can, you can code in quorums. You can code in uh, required thresholds for, for uh, you know, proposals to pass and actions to then automatically execute. Uh, but at the same time, there's necessarily some subjective concepts that that come out of DAO governance that you know fall victim to some of the 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 other governance issues of our time, whether that's uh, influenced by those with larger pockets or you know some some other social pressures, whatever they may be. But the, again, the, the great thing about DAOs is you can really make the governance and the um, the consequences deterministic and you know foreseeable, more foreseeable, I guess. I think it's a trend with crypto of just like taking something that already exists, kind of capitalism, for example, and just like making it much more transparent and much more programmable. So you can see how, how it's working better, iterate, change things, see what happens. DAOs, in my view, do kind of the same thing with social structures, where we have all these, as you were saying, governance is kind of a thing that has been going towards all of human history. And now we have that in a really visible way. You can see who actually has the power to do things, how things are moving transparently from both inside and outside the DAO. And you can just like tweak little things, see what happens if we add more people, what happens if we open voting to everyone. 
and just, yeah, it's kind of a, an experiment where you can see what happens, what works better, and then decide what to adopt. Are there specific models that you're thinking of, things that predate DAOs that like, might be influential, or like co-ops, for instance, or decentralized communities like Wikipedia? Yeah, absolutely. And co-ops are a great example. There have been several um, panels uh, about Colorado's limited cooperative um, organization. And, and the fact that a, an existing legal entity fits so well for some DAO patterns is, is kind of a pointer that there is a lot of these structures that have been honed and, and sort of uh, you know, made to be efficient and directed towards their end goal throughout throughout history in some ways. So cooperatives are one that where you, you have uh, members that are, are, are undertaking some patronage to you know, affect an end and they, they have an ownership stake in, in what they're doing. There are a lot of um, unincorporated nonprofit association wrappers that are used with DAOs where uh, a DAO that doesn't necessarily have a profit seeking motive is, is still affecting the same end and would like a coordination mechanism and some, some um, coded parameters to it. And then you know, you also have the for-profit, uh, the, the, the aims that, that have any bevy of, of organizations. But, um, you know, from there, you can kind of get even more specific. If there's a, uh, within for-profit DAOs, you could have investment clubs, you could have service entities, you could have um, other different types of, of organizations that often do have some legal structures to them that can be reflected well, or at least referenced well. Um, and within the, the, the non-profits, you know, you have, education purposes you have uh in you know open source infrastructure building that sort of thing and and so there's there's like a, a whole tree of possibilities miguel i'm i'm curious um constitution dao if i understand right kind of did an organizational speed run um what how how did that form what was that like and and what did you learn from it yeah so for context we just saw an article saying the constitution went for sale in like seven days and we rushed to organize a DAO to actually raise a significant amount of money to, uh, to place a bid on it, which we ended up getting around 42 million in four days, and actually like try to interface with real life organizations as a DAO. Um, it was really wild. <laughs> um, I think one of the key things is we just created a Discord, created a Twitter, went to bed, woke up with like <laughs> thousands of people in there, and we had to figure out how to organize people. We ended up just like going with the most, I think, natural way of coordination, which is just like making small working groups on the people that are the most involved. And everyone else was kind of just like helping promote and helping, but not that much involved in the general directions of the DAO. Because otherwise you have the kind of too many cooks in the kitchen problem where you have a lot of people running around doing different things, boring and everything, and then you don't really get anything done. So like one of the things that I, th I feel I've learned from all of this is that in my view, for DAOs to actually work, you cannot start as a fully decentralized organization. You need to have someone that, or like a group of people that actually goes and defines the mission and starts working on that. And if you look at like all of the DAOs that are building something, or most of the DAOs, they all, all, always have some kind of core team, even if it's like the Uniswap actual company or um, Party DAO is another example that has like a bunch of engineers that are actually building that are superseded by the DAO and actually enforce what the DAO chooses. But there has to be some people that are actually building because if everyone does, yeah, you cannot get anything done. And then you progressively decentralize out of that. Yeah, that, that plays into uh, another question I have because it seems like a big part of this has to do with community and communities are about trust and decentralization is about not trusting people and that seems like a central tension. So I'm really curious, like, how do you create a, a, a community in this decentralized way that, that still functions? Yeah, I, I, that, that does flow into Miguel's comments, which were great. Uh, you know, you can, you can build a DAO or a product or a community out of... Um, you know, whether it's a subjective type of mission or whether it's a, a deployed smart contract that's useful and, and you can build from there. And I think one of the, the most interesting developments in coordination and, uh, or, you know, capitalistic organization in recent memory was, was Yearn and, and how you start with a product with a so-called fair launch and it's, it's, it's strictly a, a that's a protocol that, that does what it's coded to do. You know, there's some intent events maybe in the names of the functions or the comments or, or in the docs, but at its core, it, it, it is what it is. It's a, you know, uncensorable contract and such a community has built from that, built on top of it. Uh, the ethos has grown from what was just a, a simple product and, 
you know, you, you do have DAOs that, that grow from identified founders that have a mission that they've set out, you know, they've written in a white paper, they, they go on conference stages and, and talk about it and, and then decentralize from there. And sometimes you have DAOs that grow out of a, a thing, a thing that was where the founder could be anonymous, the founder could be the protocol itself and, and people have their own interpretations and, and, and then the, the community is its sort of self-sustaining sort of mutating organism from there. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you always have some some trust in some way, at, like somewhere. If you don't have it codified in the social contract, uh, in the smart contract, or in the actual structure, you will just like have it socially somewhere. Even in communities that are created by anons, people actually do trust those people. Even in projects that are completely decentralized, they will always be like a spokesperson and like someone that if they decided, oh, I'm going to just like fork this and move over to another thing, a bunch of people will follow them. And I feel like it's important to recognize and as much as possible codify those uh, patterns in the actual contract or in the actual structure so that they are at least more visible and recognize that like pos uh, potential points of failure and plan around. Um, but yeah, I feel that is, as far as I know, not a thing that you can not have. Uh, yeah, you just have to plan around it and make sure that it won't break your own thing if it ever were to happen. I'm really glad that you brought up contracts um, because I'm familiar with the old fashioned kind of contracts that you like sign when you're selling your work. Um, and I'm, I'm really curious about how smart contracts and the sort of more legal analog contracts, let's call them, interact. Like, I know that a lot of people like to say code is law, um, but I don't think you actually want most judges to decide uh, whether your code actually is law. So I'm really curious, like, how do you, how do you create something that interacts with our existing legal framework? Yeah, you, you, you can do a number of things. You can create analog contracts that reflect the realities of what's happening in, in the technology and the code. Uh, you can rely on implied contracts because, you know, in, in a lot of DAOs and a lot of the space in general, uh, even if you choose not to make a legal designation or election as to the status of something, whether it's the entity or the, the service, the protocol, the law will make one for you in one way or another. Um, so, you know, you, you don't really scope, you don't really escape law, you don't really escape contracts. Um, it's just a matter of whether you want to define it yourself or, or let a judge do it often. Um, but, you know, at, at smart contracts, everyone goes on about how it's an inaccurate name for, for what they are. But they, they really are a means to an end. They're more of a, a piece of an existing contract or a way that a contract is executed or, or taken out than really its own uh, closed system. So they're sort of a an augmented experience for what was just an analog experience before, I guess. Yeah, I feel part of the key of that is just c c smart contracts are code and code can govern over other code. Maybe it can govern about structures that are built on code, but code can not govern over people. So you can have rules and you can have kind of laws in code over like who gets to change the deployed code, who gets to um, submit a transaction, but you can never like have a law of like someone will not run away with the keys to the Discord or something like that. So for me, the key is just like, code is law works for who can mutate or like who can change things in a protocol, who can govern th certain parameters, maybe even like who can interact with, like who can sell tokens. Maybe you have a rule that blocks someone from selling tokens like USDC has, but you can never have rules about the community or about the people problem kind of. I think that's really interesting because, um, you know, one of the main financial, not the main financial, but a big financial innovation in the 1980s was the sort of corporate raider, the Carl icon, if you will, who like buys up a bunch of company shares and then like tells the company what to do. Um, how do you prevent that from happening in a DAO? Like, how do you prevent some whale from coming in and being like, guess what? <laughs> You're going to do what I want because I have a majority voting share. I, that's a great question, and it highlights some of the best, uh, to me, some of the, the really ideal things about DAOs. Uh, the, the, the first <laughs> obvious one is they have to conceivably buy 51% of tokens, and I think some people would be very happy about that. And they'll be especially happy when they take their open source protocol and fork their DAO contract and say, come do it again, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is nice. And, and the, the thing I always like to highlight to the, the uh, say, the, the legacy corporate attorneys 
is uh, Malik Dow's rage quit function and how it's the best thing to happen to minority share interests in like any sort of corporate form in a long time. And you can permissionlessly say, I want my share and I'm out. Because if you have to do that in a traditional organization, there's paperwork, you have to pay attorneys, which, you know, not Not great. cheap. Not, no. It's, and it's a, it's a kind of beautiful, seamless thing. So the combination of that sort of free entry and exit that, uh, and the incentive, that sort of crypto economic incentive bouncing around and being able to fork uh, to, to sort of persevere how the community so chooses is, is great. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of uh, related to the whole code this law, how you were saying like if someone governance attacks a protocol and it's really clear what they are doing and they just like buy 51% of the tokens, you can just cash out, fork the protocol and do it again before the hack. And then some people will go on Twitter and say like, oh, but like governance is working as expected or whatever. And this is where, where it was like really, where I feel like the whole social aspect also matters. Because uh, sure, your protocol may be just like a DeFi protocol with, with you know, the only intent of just like being a DeFi protocol, but you will also have some social structures that maybe not defined in, in the social contract saying like, oh, if like um, John Sun just like buys all the tokens and makes it so that the only thing that you can use your protocol is with his token, you can just fork and leave he, that, that protocol with their thing, move the domain and all the assets that you actually control to the other thing. And that, I don't think that's a failure of governance. I feel like that's just like what people would expect mm -hmm. to happen because it is a governance attack, even if the systems, the governance systems are in place and work because it, it is not fulfilling the implicit um, purpose of that protocol. So I feel like that's where it's really important, the whole um, having social rules as I, uh, along the smart contract ones. So I guess that brings me to my next question. We've been talking a little bit abstractly about DAOs as entities, but I guess I'm wondering what the best use cases are. Because I, if you want to get most people involved in this kind of thing, you need to have like the equivalent of a killer app. So I, I'm wondering, like, what is what is that for DAOs? Yeah, so there are certainly a range of them, uh, but I, I think the, the the most important use case is is something that. Uh, you know, takes away control or expenses from an intermediary in some aspect, whatever that might be. So it might be uh, capital pooling and allocation permissionlessly and trans transparently. Uh, it might be resource allocation. It might be information allocation. But it's a, you know, wh wherever you're able to remove uh, information, information asymmetry and ins bad incentives from a system, there, there's arguably a purpose there. And so you see a lot of DAOs that are based around, uh, you know, services that would otherwise otherwise require a bank or would otherwise require some sort of intermediary that withholds information from the users that interact with it. Um, and so, you, you know, I, I went over a couple of different structures earlier and those structures also kind of lay out some of the, the best, I shouldn't say best, but most common use cases for DAOs now. And those often are uh, you know, community pooled and allocated funds for creating services, creating software. Uh, there's some investment clubs, there's some social justice uh, types of, of DAOs where you know, you're, you're, able to, you're able to contribute and allocate and vote as you know, a zero X address rather than a face and, and, uh, or, or someone in a given jurisdiction, whatever it might be. Um, so you know, I, I, I have now sufficiently rambled, I think, but the, the point is that you know, whenever you're able to do something directly in a sort of in a non-discriminatory way, permissionlessly, in and out, uh, you know, I, I, the the use cases are are kind of absurd when you really think about it. So, yeah, I think in general, I mean, we've seen that they are useful sometimes to just like raise funds and buy some something. Also, if you're building something that's supposed to be decentralized or that you want people to collaborate on something that you would maybe do as an open source project a few years ago, this is an opportunity to just like add an incentive layer on top of that, allow people to actually get something back for contributing. And you know, just like accelerate the network effects of something. Uh, so yeah, not, not that much to add to what you said, just in general. I feel like it's a more transparent way to build organizations that maybe don't need that much of a legal structure in the real world. I guess I, 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 the thing about transparency is that it cuts both ways. Like, look, I'm nosy. I'm a reporter. It's my job to be nosy. And like one of the things that I like about blockchains is I can see what you're all doing with your money. 
Um, and so, you know, when you're thinking about something like Constitution Dow, it's very easy for someone to see how much money you've amassed and then go, okay, I'm going to bid $1 more, um, which is, I think, kind of what happened to you guys. So I'm, I'm really curious, like, what use cases don't work for DAOs, and when does transparency work against you? I mean, I feel like in this case, with the whole Constitution DAO stuff, even if we had obfuscated the amount that we had raised um, from, like, multiple other sources, a little bit less transparently, it would still haven't worked, because we were against this briefing, which is, has a bunch of millions to spare. But even in that case... Um, First, to your point, there are solutions being developed that actually do not allow you to see everyone, that everything that is going on, or do not allow you to like, see the flow of money. So that's in progress. And at the same time, I do feel like um, transparency in most cases is a good thing. Even if you're participating in an auction, um, if people are giving their money to you and kind of have to trust you in some way, uh, it's nice for them to actually see that their money got to you and that you are not just like running away with their money. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I feel like uh, DAOs are still a like, good use case for all of these things, even with the transparency caveats, and there are like a bunch of technical solutions to solve that. In my view, the thing that they may not be great for is, as I mentioned before, if you want to do something that actually requires a lot of like real world regulation, in my experience, it, it's really hard to interface um, at the, a digital organization that is a thing that we kind of just like made up in few in the past few years with all the legal infrastructure that we've had for years now, even for actually like owning a di uh, physical item as a DAO, we had to do, go through a bunch of steps mm -hmm. and register an LLC that was governed by a DAO and a bunch of other things. So if you're doing things digitally, that's great. And luckily for us, most of the things that we do today as companies are digitally. If you're doing things that are more in the physical space, or you want to, I don't know, launch rockets into space, do things that require a lot of regulation, Maybe not for now. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I think the things that substantially rely on off-chain legal relationships uh, or that can't meaningfully be decentralized, um, and, and that's, it sounds like a cop-out answer, but it, it's, it's meant to mean things that, that are, uh, I've used a popular word this weekend, non-fungible. So, you know, if there's a, a, a small group of actors whose contributions aren't really fungible and you're relying upon their sort of, uh, you, you know, unique skill set and, and their sort of managerial efforts, if you want to get legal with it, then, um, then it's really hard to say the, the organization and motivation for these people is, is, um, be able, is, is able to be decentrally governed and uh, transparently verified, that sort of thing. Um, and, it, you know, I, I am very pro DAOs. I, I think the world of API 3 down and Lex DAO, and that's why I've devoted all my time to them. But I, I'm at the same time a huge I'm a huge skeptic of uh, DAOs that that ostensibly have a transparent purpose, but at the end of the day, they, they don't have a substantial amount of open source code or uh, you know ease of onboarding for people that that would be able to contribute. Uh, there's sort of a sometimes there's a social or community gatekeeping function that is is kind of troublesome. So that that can lead to the use case not being very DAO friendly, if, if, that's, if that's the case, but um, yeah. I think we've got a little bit less than 10 minutes left, um, and I'm willing to take questions from the audience if anybody has any. Yeah. So I'm going to repeat this so that everybody can hear it. Um, and the question was, how could a record label function as a DAO? So I, I think uh, some of the, the ways that record labels um, could be um, transparent and, and decentralized in, in their sort of governance and allocation would be, uh, you know, I, this, this, this would be an instance of a, a good amount of off-chain uh, legal legwork with the licensing of, of the, the music, the, the sort of guarantees to be between the artist and, and the label itself. But if you were to sort of DAOify the label, uh, in some respect, you know, maybe not fully because there's some protected material that record labels would not necessarily want to make public, but um, you could certainly uh, democratize some of the allocation of resources by, by vote of the DAO members, perhaps. You could also uh, use the DAO to create maybe sub-entities that, that manage and, and house some of the other, some of the IP, some of the 
sensitive material, but you, you provide more clarity and transparency and operations on sort of the whole level and, and um, uh, provide more sort of access to the interested community for that label, I guess would be my thinking. Yeah. Uh, my, my question is, so say for example, I wanted to start a community DAO, say for example, I wanted to start like a DAO, say for like the LGBTQ community, right? And what would be like the best way to structure the token incentive for myself as somebody who puts in all the work, you know, uh, creates the mission statement, recruits people, and what would be like a good fair allocation for somebody who puts in all the work for how, how would you structure this? Okay, I'm going to repeat this again because I think this is being live streamed um, and I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to hear you. So if you create a community, um, for instance, an LGBT uh, focused DAO, um, and you've put in a lot of work, how do you create a token allocation structure that makes sense for the people who have sort of founded the thing but isn't unfair? Is that fair? Yes. Okay. okay. So uh, in instead of recommending a specific framework because, you know, I'm an attorney and it would take me like an hour and I'd like be really <laughs> annoying about it. But I think that it, it's more important to think about the right questions to ask. Like, what do you really want to decentralize? Uh, conceivably, this would be a nonprofit ordeal. Um, what what are the sort of deliverables and, and how much of it could be transparent? How much of it could be programmable in, in some respect, maybe? Um, and, you know, it, it at the end of the day, it might come down to do you do you want it to be do you want to give up control? Um, you know, you mentioned you would be doing a lot of the work. You'd be the founder. You want to, you know, do you do you actually want to give up control? Maybe not. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure there's, and it could be in a later stage that you know there there's some sort of uh, broader mission that could benefit from uh, external, uh, similarly interested persons. Um, but you know, often I, I see people creating DAOs. Um, with the best of intentions, but maybe a bit too early or a, um, with, a, with a, a sort of mismatch of uh, sort of um, apportioning like a, a public community necessarily a personal goal in the beginning at least. Uh, so those are, those are some kind of intro questions to ask, but um, this is certainly not to, it's, it's a bad idea. I think it's just um, specifics are super important when you decide to say this isn't mine anymore, it's everyone's. Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel like, as I said, it is important to, I feel, start um, in a more centralized way at the start to actually get things done and then progressively decentralize once the mission and the how you're actually hoping to achieve that have, has been uh, established. So my only maybe do not think about the token allocation. Maybe start thinking about like, what can I do right now without raising funds, without doing anything? Like, who can I reach out to? What can I do without even having a token? And then once you actually have the reach and the, like the momentum to actually be able to do something with funds that you want to raise through that token, then you can start to think like, how do I distribute the value that I'm going to generate? And probably most of it should go just to like a day of, a day of rest. Some of it should go to you as the founder and the person that has put into motion and everyone that's of help. But the specifics, uh, I don't think really matter that much when you're thinking, how do I start this? They matter at that moment. And at that moment, you can just like, I don't know, ask him for, cons for a narrow of his time and talk about it or something. <laughs> Well, I think that's a that's a good note for us to end on. I want to thank you all so much for coming, and thank you to my fellow panelists for bringing their expertise. Thank you. Thank you.